Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a packed house this morning. <laughs> just ask that everyone just uh, stay in your seats and enjoy the service. Uh, for this morning, we have loving greetings from uh, Joe Knapp and Dan Annis. Uh, for prayers, if we can keep uh, Jean Teeter, uh, Henry's friend Samantha Johnson. <coughs> Excuse me. Henry, is she the one that's in the back brace? Yes. Okay. And um, after service, we are going to have a potluck. And then following that will be the annual business meeting. And we have a big congratulations to John and Julie's new grandson, Andreas Demetrius Raganesis, 8 pounds, 10 ounces, <coughs> excuse me, born on November 30th. Big congratulations to that. We are going to open with hymn 458. Take my life and let it be consecrated. Consecrated. Excuse me. <coughs> Can we please stand? blessing upon this day and upon brother Bruce as he uh, reveals what you placed upon his heart we ask that you open our spiritual hearts and minds to receive what you have to teach us and to show us be with the worship team and the music this day and, and the, the readings and we just ask that your blessing be upon all that walk in and uh, that enter in and exit through these doors this day and watch online we also ask your blessing to be upon the potluck after the service and the business meeting. We also lift up uh, Jean Teeter and Samantha, Lord. We just bring them before you and ask that your grace and mercy continuously be upon them. Wrap your arms of comfort around them that they may uh, know that they are not alone through their struggles and their trials and that they may seek you and draw closer to you and you'll draw closer to them. We also ask that you just be with all the, the suffering that's going on in this world this day we know that this is not the way it was meant to be, and we do wait for your return, Lord Jesus, to usher in your kingdom and, and to just experience, and for the rest of the world to experience what 
your original plan and desire for their for their lives is. And we just ask that you continue to strengthen the bride of Christ and be with us this day as we draw closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing uh, hymn 516, Give Up Your Best to the Master. You can stand if you'd like. Here I am. 
If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you offer yourself to the hungry and satisfy the need of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will rise up the age-old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. If you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. With great words. A small collection of people stood together, dwarfed by the size of a huge tree lying on a lawn. An elderly woman leaned on her cane and described watching the previous night's windstorm as it blew down, as she said, a majestic old elm tree. Worst of all, she continued, voice cracking with emotion, it destroyed our lovely stone wall too. My husband built that wall when we were first married. He loved that wall. I loved that wall. Now it's gone, just like him. Next morning, as she peeked out at the tree company workers cleaning up the down tree, a big smile spread across her face. In between the branches, she could just make out two adults and the boy who mowed her lawn, carefully measuring and rebuilding her beloved stone wall. The prophet Isaiah describes the kind of service God favors, acts that lift the hearts of those around us, like the wall repairers did for that elderly woman. This passage teaches that God values unselfish service to others over empty spiritual rituals. In fact, God exercises a two-way blessing on the selfless service of his children. First, God uses our willing acts of service to aid the oppressed and the needy. Then, God honors those engaged in such service by building or rebuilding our reputations as powerful forces in his kingdom. So, what services will you offer this day? Amen. Thank you for the, for the reading, Brother Richard. We now have worship songs. Good morning. Good morning. If you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in darkness. What beautiful words. This world certainly needs light. And we are called to be lights in a dark world. So it is our service that God appreciates. So as we all stand and sing, we're going to sing, Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak.
Don't matter how much money you got. Don't matter what you did for a living. Just want to follow God and be a servant of all. Stage crew was working. <laughs> you know, all the great bands have roadies to do that kind of thing. <clears throat> Maybe this year.
again. Thank you for that wonderful singing. It is now my privilege to bring forth Brother Bruce, who is going to be speaking to us this morning on Fear Not. Fear Not. So, Fear Not, Brother Bruce, and come forward. I will. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for those devotions this morning. We're right in tune. I don't know about the singing, but the <laughs> but the thoughts. It's so encouraging to sit down and have a talk all prepared and come in and the devotions go right along with it. Fear not. When the CBC Planning Committee gathered on a Zoom call this fall to begin our plans and preparations for the 115th Christian Believers Conference next summer, one of the first items always on the agenda, once we finally settle down and get to business, is to come up with a theme and then we build our conference around, around the theme. Typically, this is a rather lengthy process as we gather suggestions from attendees of, of the conference and they, they give us their thoughts of what they, what they think a nice uh, theme might be. As well as, of course, we have the thoughts and preferences of seven committee members of course, there being you know, myriads of, of really good theme possibilities every year. And so the process of theme discussion is given a rather lengthy slot of time when we start our, our deliberations. A good theme and conference is geared toward being relevant to the challenges and the trials that attendees are currently experiencing. Of course, in this ever-changing world, knowing what is going to be going on in August 2024, back in October 2023, is a guess at best. But that's why we pray. We pray to the one who knows what will be needed in 2024 and why. We pray to him to direct our conference as he has the past 114 conferences, and to give us a theme totally in line with his will. And that way we know it will always be what we need to hear. So as we joyously gathered back again, still there were clouds gathering about us that we all seem to sense. Were the winds of war gathering for another big one? Or were these uh, wars and rumors of wars that are always circling around the, the world? Are we headed for another round of great disobedience and riots as we had in the late 60s and 70s? The government is spending trillions and trillions more and still less and less people seem satisfied, save those who are among the very rich. But the harbinger for Christians in such times has been and should always be the church. And yet, you see churches splitting over whether the Bible, the inerrant word of God is true and relevant today. Does the word of the never-changing, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, God Almighty, need to be updated, become more inclusive? How can it be more inclusive? When the call goes out to the whole world, when Almighty God sacrifices His only begotten, sinless, perfect Son to pay for the sins of the whole world, how is one more inclusive than that? The invitation, the call was out to all, but have no doubt, 
the terms to come and be reconciled back to our Creator are all on His terms. God had provided the way, the way back to Him, the way back to Him and eternal salvation. Jesus Christ. There are many church denominations and religions and many who claim their head to be Jesus Christ and then ignore so much of his teachings and examples that he gave us on how we are to live. Psalm 91 4 says, He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Under his wings, we are to take refuge. Not that his wings will follow me around and cover me wherever I go and whatever I want to do. We are covered when we're under his wings. His truth. Not our truth. Not my truth, not your truth, but his truth shall be our shield and our buckler. That's where we need to remain. His truth does not need updating or correcting. Maybe how we deliver the message so that it is better understood in this ever-changing world, that may change, but his truth does not change. Not one iota. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the accurate knowledge of the truth. God calls men to come to the truth, come to know the truth. The truth is not changed to, to accommodate the preferred roots of men. The churches of, the, of religion are no longer a refuge from the fears of this world because there is no power to keep the truth. Not once the truth has changed to accommodate men. Apostle Paul describes many churches of today, the churches in the final days. In 2 Timothy he writes, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Oh, they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. No matter how much you study or train, how much you know the polluted gospel, you will never come to the knowledge of the truth and live with its power until you take upon yourself the yoke of Jesus Christ until you become tethered to the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, the pure, unaltered word of God. You aren't yoked to Dennis. You aren't yoked to me. We do the best we know, but your responsibility is to the one head of the church, Jesus Christ, and the truth of God's word. If the individuals, families, country, and or world find themselves in extreme trouble, what can we best do to help them? If that's the conditions in August, what, what best can we do? Our theme has, was arrived at and accepted by all seven members, not in hours as we put aside, but in minutes. Our theme for the 115th CBC will be Fix Your Eyes on Jesus. Wow. Really? That's a bit simple, isn't it, Brother Bruce? Almost infantile. Are we going to go back to Sunday school at, at CBC? Simple, oh yes. In times of great trouble, who else are we going to go to? Where else do we send you? 
From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with Jesus no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered, God bless Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who else are we going to look to? The government? Your bank account? In times of great trouble, you find out how many true friends you have. If you're lucky, you'll have some family to help for a while. And you have your church family who love you and will keep pointing you to the one. The one who is your true, true north of, for truth. And pointing and moving you toward the kingdom. Come now into the kingdom of God. Be yoked to the king and abide with him. Where else should we fix our eyes for peace and assurance during turbulent times? The first big plus, if you are focused on Jesus, you are not focused on yourself. When you are focused on Jesus, you are seeing others more needy and important than yourself. And you help them with, and when you help them, you will find that God is always, always working out your needs for you. He knows your needs and he will take care of them. He'll take care of them while you're working and helping others. You want to be great in the kingdom? If you are totally focused on your own issues and problems and think you will fix them yourself if you just try harder and spend more time on yourself, you may well find yourself debilitated with fear when all your options run out. I take care of number one. That used to be a cry back in our day, was it not, Brother Richard? I often heard it, and actually I lived by that for many years. I had fun, and much of the things that should have made me happy, I was doing. I had a wife who was always succumbing to my wishes, trying to make me happy. But not until I learned to look into this mirror of what we call the Bible that I see the real me, which was nowhere close to the one I envisioned myself to be. I had quite an opinion of myself. Blessed was I that the Lord had started me up this trail of seeing the real me, knowing that what we had was not because of my hard work and my smarts and my will, self-will driven self-confidence. I had learned and repeated often, my confidence is not in the things that I had, but my faith was in the Lord. I did learn to say that. And I said it often. I learned to say it. I learned to say it, but now it was time to know it, to know it to be true. Similar to Peter, Luke 22, 30 to 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have 
Return to me. Strengthen your, bro your brethren. And then, and not unlike Job, we read in Job 1, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch it out. Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has, in, has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Well, we were about to be sifted like wheat. As Peter was, I was so cocksure of myself. As Peter was of his love for the Lord and that he would never fail. I too had a lot of confidence in my will to stay faithful. Like Job, I had many reasons to love and serve the Lord. But take away his building, take away his business, take away his job, take away his house and bank account and see if he really trusts the Lord as he so smugly loves the state. Like the great philosopher Mike Tyson says, yeah, everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. <laughs> we were floored. All things I told Sherry we had, and to stop worrying, are now gone, empty. For the next three years or so, I truly learned that I had nothing to worry about, that God loves me and will take care of us. I learned not only to quote Romans 8.28, but as it says, we know, I learned to know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I know it is true. Not because I heard it. Not because I read it. I lived it. With our material world and plans and shambles, starting all over at 44 years old, 45 actually, I was asked to be an elder at CBF. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. I needed to go find and start a new career. I did not have time to keep up with the church work that I was already doing. I should be looking at pulling back and getting on to what I have to do and what I do best. Or what Dennis talked about last week, what was urgent, but not what was important. Jesus says, you are mine, you work for me, I'll take care of you. I knew that as slow as I read and put together studies and talks, I'm looking at a 30 hour or better commitment each week to church. How could I do that and go find and start a new career? Our trek through the desert lasted three or four years as miracle after miracle came our way. Every time we were tripped, we were, we were trapped or stuck. 
somehow we got out of it. And I can't tell you many times, I can't tell you how it happened. I never did start a new career, I just followed as God led me into different, seemingly dead-end jobs, and yet each one teaching me something I needed to learn to help me be a better elder. Clearly, God was in charge in preparing me for being an elder. What do you think my first job was in preparation for eldership? I was a used car salesman. <laughs> Is that not the training grounds for most people in the ministry? Not a typical starting place <laughs> one would think of preparation for the ministry, but hey, you remember that God prepared Moses to lead the Israelites with 40 years of experience? Doing what? Tending sheep. My ways are not your ways, says God. Always remember that. This unorthodox job comes with an astounding turn of events and intervention, which allowed me to actually keep this used salesman's use car sales for his job. After the three week training period, I was given an assignment. And if I couldn't fulfill the assignment, it showed that I was not a car salesman, used or otherwise. I, I went out that night and I, and I could not do it. Now I could have lied and I could have made up a story and filled in all the answers to the questions I had to answer to keep the job that I needed so bad. But I couldn't lie. What a bummer. What a bummer. I was really down. After having lost everything already, we were trying to get back on our feet. We had moved into a new apartment. I finally got a job. I can, we can start building again. And now here I am on a walk with Sherry, trying to come up with a way to tell her I'm gonna be fired tomorrow. As if she hadn't gotten enough Bad news for me. As we headed up the hill, a new neighbor saw us. And they came out to introduce themselves to us. They volunteered the answer to every question I needed to have to do the assignment to save my job. I never asked them one question. You are mine. You work for me. My assignment was to go out to dinner, find a total stranger and strike up a conversation with him and bring back their name, occupation, where they lived, um, a couple other general information, things about them. I'm an introvert. And even with the most important job of my life on the line, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Probably only a full, true introvert would understand, but it is a fact. I had to fight a dragon rather than... Give Sherry one more piece of bad news. And this was going to be another big one. 
Would this be the last straw for her? She had put up with so much over the years. We were starting all over again. We had a new apartment, a new school for Sam. Mandy was off to college and now this. I had prayed for a job. The one where God wanted me and my, my giant stood there and whipped me like a rented mule. I know this isn't exactly parting the Red Sea, but at this time, I, I tell you, it's like Exodus 14 where Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. You are mine. You work for me. I can't describe the elation and awe I felt as I returned to the house, picked up the assignment sheet, and answered every question. God wanted me to be a used car salesman. At least for now. Matthew 6.33 Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Here we have another verse. I had learned and learned to quote well, and I had used it often in my 12 years at CBF to this point. I knew it was true. It's in the Bible. It's a promise of God. So mentally I understood and I accepted it fully. Now I was to learn and come to know that it is true. While my material world was disintegrating about to be blown up, I was asked to become an elder. Brother Andrew needed help and I had always just wanted to be used and I was willing to do whatever was needed that I could do. But I explained our situation to Brother Andrew, that we had lost everything and even though there was nothing left to get, I was still not sure that I was not going to be forced into bankruptcy, which I felt would be a stain on the church. He asked if I had been forthright in my business dealings, and I assured him that, I, that we had, my partner and I had. And he said, then if, if these were just the business doings of the times, those of you who were around in the mid-90s know there were many contractors forced into bankruptcy at that time. And we had on, and Andrew Athens, we had honorably um, done business that it would not be a stain on CBF. I just prayed and I followed. I really didn't have time for this now. This isn't a good time. I became an elder. In the 24 years we'd been married, Sherry and I had at least one house in 23 of those 24 years. Now we had none. And to be able to rent the duplex we wanted in Dover, we had to sign a five-year lease. I want to quickly share some facts, not to bore you to death, but just to stress to you how I know. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you, is indeed fact. Amen. 
During our five-year journey in the desert, I'll call it, Sherry still had a job at UNH as an administrative assistant, which she had all the five years and uh, was, was doing well. In that five-year period, I never made even a median wage as I worked as a temp at the post office twice, sold cars for about seven months, and actually made an average wage those seven months. I learned how to approach perfect strangers and how to engage them in conversation, finding common ground. You see why God wanted me to be a, be a salesman? Seven months, that's enough of that. Let's go. I had a job as a, I got a job as a low man on a totem pole in the receiving department and warehouse for a manufacturing company. For the first time in my working life, I started at 18 years old. I had summer job before that, but for the first time, I wasn't working five and a half days a week. One condition of my car salesman job was that I could not work Sundays before one o'clock. In retrospect, I could not have done both eldership and run the business and do justice to both. I also know that having been 23 years, 17 of them as a business partner with the same great guy, and he too having put all he had into those years that I could never just leave him and dump, dump it on him. The Lord took it away. And I praise him for that. For I could not seek ye first something else until the business was removed. All the jobs I had were jobs that once I punched out of work, I was done. I really didn't need to think about, there was nothing to think about with any of them until I returned on Monday. This enabled me to put first, first. Although an elder, I was really an elder in training, and the extra responsibilities and duties were both tough and rewarding. And having been blessed with a teacher, an example of extraordinary, extraordinary gifts, my temporal work easily became very secondary. In the last year and a half of our desert excursion in Dover, I did not remain the low man on the totem pole for long. The warehouse manager kept pushing off all the out of routine things that he didn't want to do and all the new things he would just dump them on me. I understand, I had 24 years in the, in, in the wholesale business, and that's warehousing. And the plant manager was watching and noticed, and he moved the warehouse manager to sales so that I could be made warehouse manager. All the things I had been suggesting for beneficial changes were summarily rejected over the past two years, I instituted, and after about a year, the plant manager came out one night after work, and we took a walk around the production floor. I was working as unto the Lord. The warehouse manager had, had no right having me do all, all, his, all that work because I was still a low man on the totem pole. But I was working as unto the Lord, doing the best that I could, not to man.
So the plant manager comes out after work and says, come on, Bruce, let's take a walk. So we walked around and he says, uh, what would you change about the production floor? A year and a half later, I mean earlier, I was the low man in the receiving department, right? Again, in retrospect, this was the this was the plant manager. He and the production floor manager had set up and run the production floor. I mean, this was his baby. So quite, I wasn't. I wasn't expecting that question. So quite undiplomatically, I just blurted out, I changed the whole thing. I should have been a low man on the prom <laughs> and receiving once again. In my jobs, I had spent four years observing the production floor, listening to all the whining and complaining. I knew who the real workers were and who were those taking credit for others' work. A couple of months later, they let the production manager go. And I was made what they called coach of manufacturing. As I was still computer illiterate and petrified of computers and couldn't do all the reports, so I could not be made the production manager. But I was running the production floor, even though I didn't know which end of a screwdriver to use. For the last year in Dover, I finally was making more than a median wage. So after four years in the desert, we had no debt. We had a couple thousand dollars in the bank, I think. And we had to start thinking about whether we wanted to sign another five-year lease or not. Again, Mandy had moved to Chicago. Sammy had left home after going to UNH, and she never returned to live with us. Things were going well at CBF, and we had kept our heads above water, but we really had nothing to speak of that we knew. But we had everything we needed, just like God promised. 1 Peter 5, 6 to 7 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. This too I can vouch for with full assurance is true. Like Peter, I didn't have to humble myself, for Satan sifted me like, like wheat. And though I had no idea really where we were going or what I was doing. I served the Lord and I took work one day at a time. Now for the first time in 23 years, I didn't have to worry about the house. I didn't have to mow the lawn. I didn't have to shovel the driveway. I didn't have to work on Saturday. And when you own and work a small business and you have to make a payroll every week, especially when you're trying to grow the business, you never really stop thinking about work. It's always there. It's always there. You do other things, but in the back of your mind, work is always there. After 17 years, I was free. I had nothing to worry about losing. I had nothing to worry about preserving. Because we had nothing. One Saturday morning, at home, I was reading the business section of the previous Sunday paper, and I noticed a headline that said something like, Textron, two for one split. I had long forgotten that 
we did have one thing left. Sherry had a hundred shares of Touchstone stock from when she worked there years before. I never knew what they were worth. I, you know, they weren't, couldn't be worth much. So now, with a two for one split, Sherry owned 200 shares. But of course, the value of each stock is uh, now worth half as much as it was, so she still owned the same not much amount, right? Well, for some reason, the stock value had jumped right back to nearly the same value as it was before it split. I mean quickly, like in the summer. So I'm wondering, well, what are those 200 shares of Touchstone actually worth? It was enough for a down payment on a house, better than we had lost the four years earlier. Sherry was now administrative assistant to one of the deans at UNH. Somehow I was coach of manufacturing and we were moving in to a new house for us. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Both are true. And I know much more now than just being able to quote them. When I tell you these things, I'm telling you from experience. These should have been and could have been five of the greatest, relaxing, most peaceful years of our 53 years together. So why was it not? I can list you time after time how we had needs that seemed overwhelming and yet they were taken care of. And I don't even remember why or how. God was with us, but I kept looking at what I had lost, not what I had. I couldn't see and didn't know where I was going. Then I knew that trouble was never far behind and that I had no cushion to fall on when it, would, when it caught me. I was still living in fear. What is the most repeated commandment, command in the scriptures? I ask you. 365 times, one for every day of every year, in the scriptures, this command is given. Anyone want to guess? You remember what the title of this talk is? Fear not. Fear not. <laughs> fear not. 365 times, it says in the scriptures, fear not. Only fear not. It was fear that robbed us from the peace and joy we could have had and should have been reveling in. That he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. We failed to cast all our cares upon him. In fact, we kept most all of those cares pretty close. Foolishly thinking, I've got to work these things out. I've got to work these things out. Joshua 1, 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Hey, I know these scriptures too. But do I really know them? Walk by faith, not by sight. Absolutely, absolutely. Walk by faith, not by sight. As long as you show me where I'm going and how I'm going to get there, my sight of the future, which I have been building toward for, for 20 years, 
was blown up and I was walking blind now, just following the Lord. I was walking, but I had not yet cast all my cares upon him. Matthew 8, 23 to 27. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, and said, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Now understand, these are lifetime fishermen. They have been caught many times out on the Sea of Galilee, where it's not that unusual to have these great tempests arise out of nowhere. They are in far more than just danger. They are doomed, and they know it. Out of desperation, they wake Jesus up. Do they really think he can stop the sinking boat? They know he has saved others, but how come he doesn't know what's going on here now? Where is he when we need him? He's sleeping. But Jesus said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Why shouldn't they be fearful? They're doomed. Don't they know who Jesus is? Yes, they know who Jesus is. They've, been, they've seen him in action, but until this point, they don't know the half of who Jesus is. They don't know who they themselves are. Not really. They're hoping to get a good seat at the table when Jesus runs off the Romans. They have yet to realize that they have been chosen to be a part of the foundation upon which Jesus Christ will build his church and through which the whole world will have opportunity at eternal life. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Do they know who Jesus is? They know a little better now. We need to go through experiences to know these, these truths. 365 times we are commanded to fear not, not because there is no trouble and no things for which are worthy of fear, if our eyes are fixed upon ourselves and the conditions around us, we are insane if we aren't fearful. Focus. Focus. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. Know who he is. Know what he can do. Know what he has promised to do. Know who you are. You are the children of God, heirs of God, and co-heirs with the only begotten Son of God, chosen by God with purpose, chosen with God for work. Let me close with a reading from the Daily Man of November 28. Taken from Job 34, 29. When he giveth quietness, who then can make trouble? Who but he, the God of all comfort, can give quietness in the midst of tumults, which rise upon the soul like a sudden storm upon the sea? Like ocean mariners in peril, we cry unto him, and he bringeth us to the desired haven, blessed haven of quietness and peace in God. What is the cry which brings this answer of peace? Is it not a prayer that all occasion for disturbance shall be removed? For it is not always the divine will to bring peace to the human spirit in that way. It is not always the best way. 
But there is a cry which never fails to bring the quietness of which none can make trouble. It is the prayer of sweet, trustful, loving, acquiescence to the will of God. Those five years in Dover were good years, but they could have been many, many times more joyful and appreciative had we just prayed for sweet, trustful, loving acquiescence in the will of God knowing that God had everything under control, knowing that God had a plan, knowing that God had us moving in the right direction, though it certainly didn't seem it many times. I know we will have challenges and troubles this year, as we do every year, and they may well be tougher than usual or maybe not. We are called to be overcomers. Ronald Reagan once said, evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. Fear not. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, Jesus says. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Amen. Know who Jesus is. Know who you are and go. Fear not. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God had his blessings. Amen. Thank you very much for that, Brother Bruce. It was a great reminder, and I'm sure all of us have stories like that, and we should all make sure that we do not forget where we've come from, the struggles we've gone through, or where the Lord has brought us through. For if we do forget those things, then how, how tough will the, the new trials come if we don't have that faith to hold on to what he brought us through prior to that. So again, thank you, Brother Bruce. Closing him. Uh, 585, I think. Five, is that, is that correct? Uh, 585? Can we please stand? Uh,
Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, God the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, the giver of every good and perfect gift. Father, this morning we gather rejoicing, being reminded of times how you have delivered us. We are your children. May that never escape us. Troubles that may be coming this year, there will be some for sure. What they are, we can know for sure that you know them. And you are already preparing us for them. All we have to do is not fear. Know who you are. God Almighty. Know who your Son is, how you have given all power in heaven and earth unto him and his great love for us. May we be confident that all the things that we go through, even though they be hard and they be dark <laughs> and we're walking with blinders on, we just listen to your voice and follow. You will never leave us nor forsake us. You are, we have Jesus in the boat with us to lead us and guide us. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask your blessings upon our, our food, which we are about to partake of, and the meeting, which is to follow. And we ask all these things and through the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.